Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I am Rabbi David Wozniaka, director of the Bronfman Center for Jewish Life here at the 92nd Street Y, and I'd like to welcome you to the inaugural evening of this series, our forum on contemporary values. In your hand is a brochure describing the programs in Jewish life here at the 92nd Street Y, everything from lectures and classes, seminars and programs on a whole host of, of issues. I hope you'll join us, including the next two parts of this series with Rabbi Harold Kushner next Thursday night, and then on the 30th of March with um, Police Chief Reuben Greenberg from Charleston, South Carolina. Also, index cards will be passed out for your questions, and we look forward to them. Before I introduce our distinguished guest this evening, I just want to take a moment to introduce my co-moderator for this series, Rabbi Joseph Telushkin, who I am very pleased to be working with. Rabbi Telushkin is an author that is known to many of you. He has written on a diversity of areas of Jewish life. Most recently, uh, his books, Jewish Literacy and Jewish Humor, and he also co-authored the screenplay of the movie, The Quarrel. Elie Wiesel certainly no, needs no introduction to any audience in the United States. And after a quarter of a century of speaking from this stage, a stage which seems to be transformed uh, from a stage into an inviting classroom when he speaks, he needs no introduction at the 92nd Street Y. But I would like to take just a moment to remind us about a man who has reminded us of so much. He is a Nobel Peace Prize winner and Boston University professor and has worked on behalf of oppressed people for much of his adult life. His firsthand witnessing of the Holocaust has led him to use his talents as an author, teacher, and storyteller to defend human rights and peace throughout the world. His work has earned him the Presidential Medal of Freedom, the United States Congressional Gold Medal, and the Medal of Liberty Award the rank of Grand Officer in the French Legion of Honor, and in 1986, the Nobel Peace Prize. He has written more than 30 books for which he has won numerous distinguished awards. A native of Siga, Transylvania, Eli and his family were deported by the Nazis when he was 15 years old. His mother and younger sister perished there. His two older sisters survived. He and his father were later deported to Buchenwald. Three months after receiving the Nobel Peace Prize, he established the Elie Wiesel Foundation for Humanity to advance the cause of human rights and peace throughout the world. The Foundation's first major project was an international conference of Nobel laureates convened jointly by Mr. Wiesel and French President Mitterrand. Seventy-five laureates from five countries met in Paris to discuss facing the 21st century threats and promises. This was followed by a series of conferences on the anatomy of hate, co-sponsored by Boston University, a conference with Haifa University, conferences in Oslo and in Moscow, and recently in New York, a conference on the anatomy of hate, Saving Our Children, co-sponsored with Governor Cuomo. He lives here in New York with his wife and his son, and we are honored to have you open this series this evening. start off with a simple question. Since our topic is building a moral society, I'd like you to imagine, if you can, that a new post were created, moral advisor to the president, and uh, that you were the appointee. Assuming that you accepted, what would be the first issues that you would choose to speak about with President Clinton? I think I wouldn't last long there, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't last long with any president. Uh, I, I have a good uh, background in that. I give advice unsolicited, and, and, and the presidents don't listen, either here or anywhere, by the way. Well, suppose uh, if, if, if I could speak and the president could listen, I would try to humanize, to humanize whatever endeavors the, uh, and the administration would undertake. It must have a human face. Uh, when I travel anywhere 
to a city. The city, to me, has a face. It's always one face. When I teach, I see a face in front of me. And I would advise to the president that he should have a face. A face, uh, you know, we, we, we take it really from our tradition. Uh, but what I like about it is, remember, not long ago we read in the Bible, Yosef at Sadiq, Joseph. Joseph was mm -hmm. in Egypt, <coughs> in Israel, what means in, in, in the Jewish land, his brothers sold him and tortured him, tormented him. In Egypt, he made a career. And at one point, he made such a career that he almost forgot who he was. At that point, says Rashi, as you remember, he saw the Mut Diokno Shel Aviv. He saw the face of his father. Mm -hmm. And he was about, really about, to give up his Jewishness. It is the face of his father. So I would say to the president, look for a face. Uh, and then we would discuss, of course, which face. But which face? <laughs> <laughs> I would listen first. Talking you know, of the issues of the faces, because one of the issues that we're thinking of today is what's going on in Bosnia. Now, I know you have written recently about it. You have visited the area. I want to pursue two things. What you think can be done, because it parallels horrors of this century. But even before then, I think you can do something even more directly educative to this audience. You know that part of the world so much better than we do. I'd venture to guess I'm not alone in not, in not understanding exactly what's going on there. I know I put you on the spot. I don't know if you understand exactly. But what are the divisions there in a sense? <coughs> and what did you find? And what, what can be done? The, the early question, the first question is easier to answer. It means it's, it's, it's a complex situation which is not new. The divisions are ethnic, religious, and political, and economic, and so forth. However, the hatred which is there, which I found there, I have not seen anywhere since 1945. Anywhere. A modern war, as we know, is a faceless war. Somewhere there is a pilot, or here there is a gunner, and he presses a button, and 100 people die, or 1,000 people die. He doesn't know who they are. He never saw them. He doesn't know their family. Nothing. Press the button. In Yugoslavia, in former Yugoslavia, people who know each other kill each other. It's more than a civil war. It's a kind of religious war. It's a fratricide. People who are so angry because of memory. To me, it was particularly distressing because I believe in memory. I, as a Jew, believe that one of the most important lessons in history or in our religion is memory. I believe memory brings people together. I believe memory has a redemptive quality. There is the opposite. Because they remember that they hate each other, because they remember what was done. One person says to me, what? You want me to speak to that person? That he raped my mother. The other one said, he killed my sister. It goes on. That memory is there, and it's so strong. Now, I went there really because of my Jewishness. I felt that as a Jew, always as a Jew, I had to be there and, 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 and see what, bear witness and see what is happening. Also, there's a Jewish community there. We arrived on a Friday afternoon. It was, and my conditions then were that I don't want any, any dinners, I don't want cocktails, I don't want nothing. Just go and see the prisoners and come back. Little did I know, we arrived on a Friday, we went to a press conference with the president there. And after the press conference, the president, who is, I think, compared to the others, I think, better, took me by my arm and led me to a door. I didn't know where the door led. But he opened the door, and there I was in the middle of a state dinner, in my honor. Mm -hmm. With me, the entire diplomatic corps, parliamentary uh, people there. What do you do? So luckily, you know, luckily, my Jewishness helps me. And it was Friday afternoon, late afternoon. So we came to my place, to my seat opposite the president. I asked for attention, and they thought I was going to to, to bring a toast, I said, Mr. President, I'm a Jew. It's Friday evening. I have to go to shul. <laughs> <laughs> Which I did. <laughs> I left everybody and went to shul. 
And there is a small community, there's a chief rabbi, a poor man, 80, 85 years old, and then I had dinner with him. Uh -huh. A Shabbat, real Shabbat dinner, a kosher Shabbat dinner with him. But once you enter there, you are caught by their logic, you are caught by their policy, that they have the, their target is not your target, their goal is not your goal. So what I saw is, I must tell you, terrifying. Uh, mainly in Sarajevo. Sarajevo, which is a city, the saddest city in the world today. There must be many sad cities in India these days, but it's the saddest city because it's lifeless. It is under siege. And I believe, by the way, that siege, laying siege, is a crime. It's, it, it is criminal because they wage war not against military, but against the civilian population. Mm -hmm. So you see children in the street and they have nowhere to go. You see a store, a shoemaker without shoes, a grocery without grocery. Mm -hmm. That means the shell is there, often bombed, and uh, you don't want to do that. In, after Sarajevo, in Sarajevo, there is a, uh, the president there is at Bekovic, and I saw him too. So one Jew asked to speak, and he said, please, you must help us. In Belgrade, another Jew asked, you must help us. I saw they wanted me to help them as Jews. Not at all. The, Serbi the Serbian Jew said, help us Serbs. Mm. The, um, the Bosnian Jew said, help us Bosnians. The hatred has permeated that community too. So what to do? If Clinton uh, had a, has somebody here, uh, I would ask him uh, to, to, to say, I believe really only in a dramatic, spectacular gesture, which I tried to explain in a, in a piece last week in the New York Times. It would be so beautiful if the first foreign policy gesture coming from the president would be to have a summit meeting in Sarajevo with many of the world leaders, and they would summon the five presidents of former Yugoslavia, and they would tell them what Carter told Sadat and Begin, you are not leaving this place until a solution is found. It would be irresistible. They have to do something. Mm -hmm. So you see, this is what I would tell President Clinton. Mm -hmm. if he, I would advise it for 24 hours. <laughs> that gets into the issue of military intervention a little bit. And I'm wondering if you see anything in the Jewish tradition that can guide us on such an issue. We have often been critical of the United States for having not intervened on behalf of the Jews, on behalf of the world, 50 years ago. Is there anything in our tradition which can guide us as to when we might intervene or not intervene militarily in other parts of the world today? Well, number one, of course, that is the, the, the law in the, the Bible. You shall not stand idly by. Uh, if people are killed, I think, as Jews, as human beings. But to me, it's the same thing as a Jew. I believe a Jew is human as a Jew. And non-Jews may say the same thing about their condition. But uh, we have to follow that. If people are killed, children are massacred, starved, we cannot intervene. I must tell you, when Begin brought, he was the first to bring boat people to save both people and bring them to Israel. I was very proud of, of Begin and of Israel then, that, they, that Israel was the first to see that refugees need help and we Jews should help them, and he brought them to Israel. Mm -hmm. The same thing now, there are, I think, 82 uh, Bostons who came, who came to Israel. It's a gesture. It is a gesture. Uh, now, what we should do, should we intervene militarily? That's the question. But I'm not a military man. I never had a gun in my hand. I spoke to military people, to the UN people there, generals and so forth, and the uh, opinions are, are divided. The main question is, can, can one do it without beginning a new Vietnam? I'll tell you why. Under Tito, they were afraid of Russian aggression. So what they did under Tito, that they dug caves under the mountains, and it's a mountainous area, and filled those caves with weapons. They have enough weapons there for years. Now to start waging war there is not an easy thing. 
However, if a decision is made, I, I think uh, that they could do it. On the other hand, bombing certain positions would be easier. What is clear that they should stop it somehow? It's, it, it's, not, it's not good for the world because it's only the beginning of a chapter. Uh, the next step will be Kosovo, which means you may have the entire NATO involved in that war. You may have Europe at war. How to do it? You know what I think also comes as a shock? The realization that there are these phenomenally deep hatreds that no one really outside of these areas knew about. Did anybody predict? I don't recall reading any articles that the breakup of communism was going to lead to this sort of deep-seated, vicious hatreds. It's just, you know, how much time is needed for hatred to, to, to take off like that? I'm thinking. Everybody knew that there was anti-Semitism in Germany prior to 1933, but had somebody visited Germany in 36, 37, they'd probably come back and report, you cannot believe the depth of hatred against the Jews. And yet, how does it come about? That's what I'm wondering. Because 10 years earlier, people would not have reported that depth of hatred against the Jews. Well, whatever happened in Eastern Europe in 1989, actually, was a defeat for all the intelligence services in the world. Not a single intelligence service had could foresee what happened, which, by the way, shows something to me. It means that they're all useless. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> no, the KGB, the CIA, nobody, no, not even the Mossad, which is probably the best. They didn't know what was coming. And it came as a surprise. Why as a surprise? Because they couldn't foresee Gorbachev's coup, they couldn't perceive uh, Yeltsin's uh, emergence. Nothing was foreseen. It came as a shock to everybody. Now, what the hatred was there, except under Tito, Tito suppressed everything else. So he suppressed that too. The same is true in, in Russia, what used to be the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. The hatred for Jews or for each other was there. But anyone who dared hate freely would go to jail, would be killed. <laughs> now, when the elite was off, everything came up. Mm -hmm. My problem with them is, and I, I said it to all these people, I said, look, what you are doing now, you are moving us to doubt democracy, which means under Tito, everything was all right. Many people were in jail, but mm -hmm. it wasn't all right for them. <laughs> but right. but uh, everything was OK. There was no war. Now, under democracy, there is war. Does it mean that the democracy failed? Does it mean you prefer, you prefer a, di a benevolent dictatorship? Now, I believe, personally, as I'm sure you do, that there is no substitute for democracy. It is still, with all of its faults, the best the most human and the most civilized form of society that we can invent or imagine. And yet, you know, it's, I find it very appropriate that you were there with your message for yet another reason, because why do the intelligence services fail and why do a lot of the predictions fail? Because they think in terms of power blocks and other things. And I think the message you convey, and I think the message we feel Judaism conveys, is that the only significant issue is how to be a better person. It's interesting to me that Jews are not more obsessed as a rule with that issue. I mean, because we are the ones who've suffered when society goes bad. And it's ultimately people who have the power and who are decent will not exercise it in an immoral way. And people who don't have great power will exercise it in an immoral way. And I wonder if that lesson is going to be picked up. It seems tragically not. I know for years I remember thinking, if only the Soviet Union, if communism would end in Russia, there is no question that that act immediately would propel the world morally higher. First of all, as a Jew, I'd be happy because I felt things in the Middle East would improve greatly. And then it would seem all over the world there would be this great liberation. And I think it's one of the saddest things that the demise of communism in Russia so far does not seem to have had made the world a much brighter place. Well, the difference is that we Jews don't seek power. Uh, we are afraid of power. We don't want power. The only power that we want is a moral power, even better than that, an intellectual power. Uh, the power of Talmud Chacham, mm -hmm. somebody who learns. The learner has power. What power do I have? I know how to use words. Big deal. 
But that is the power. We don't want the real titles and positions. We never want that. That's why in the, in the Torah we say, we don't want kings, because the king represents power. What do we want? We want the Navi, a prophet, who, who elected him. Isaiah would fail uh, in, 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 any, in, in any election. Uh, which prophet wouldn't fail? They would all fail. They were all hated by the people they, they came to prophesy to. And all of them were killed, by the way, sometimes tragically, by the people that they tried to improve. So what do we want, really, is learning. Go and tell Tito then, or, or uh, go and tell uh, Milosevic today, that, you know, the real power, Mr. Milosevic, is learning. Mm-hmm. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> it's interesting. I think that the only, you're speaking of power as opposed to learning, I think that the... Uh... What, 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 what reflects that is that the only thing that the Jewish people have ever crowned is the Torah. Keter Torah, don't absolutely. Crown Keter our Torah, kings. Yeah. Also speaking, Keter Kehuna also. There's also a crown of Kehuna, of priesthood. Right. Since we're speaking about Judaism and the next generation of Jews, and obviously it is clear that uh, for far too many Jews, Judaism is perhaps not as central to their lives as we might want it to be. I'm curious what you might say to a Jew particularly a young Jew who did not find Judaism meaningful in his or her life? Well, I, I would try to show the beauty, not even the truth, but the beauty of Judaism for a Jew, and I insist on that, always for a Jew. I would try to show to the Jewish boy or girl that there is so much excitement, so much inspiration, so, such a richness in, 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 in the Jewish tradition, in Jewish learning, in Jewish culture, in Jewish law, that to waste it is silly. I would try to show to that boy and girl that a Jew who is not involved with his or her Jewish memory, which is all-encompassing because it brings everything together, is mutilated. One cannot be fully human as a Jew if one doesn't know what Jewishness means. So I would take that boy and girl for a week, and I would uh, spend with them really every day teaching a page here, explaining a law there, tell a story, and, and see how all of that feels, fits together. There is a harmony in, in Judaism beyond the paradox, because there are so many contradictions and paradoxes. There is a harmony which no human being could uh, get away with without seeing the beauty in it. When you say you would insist on it for a Jew, I'm curious, at this point, uh, statistics suggest that over 50% of Jews are intermarrying. The future viability of Jewish life in America is going to depend, in one respect, on encouraging many of the non-Jews who marry Jews to convert to Judaism. Are you comfortable encouraging non-Jews? I'm th- I ask you specifically, in a sense, too, because you're so aware of the tragic fate people have often had being Jews. Are you comfortable encouraging non-Jews to convert to Judaism? Look, I, I, I would encourage, if already, let's say, if there is already a couple and they are getting married because he fell in love with her, she fell in love with him, and, and they know that they are meant for each other. I, at least no matter what I would say, they would get married. Right. And then I think I would try to show the necessity, not, not only not to lose, but to open ourselves, to open our doors. You know, as you know very well, we don't encourage uh, proselytism, we don't encourage conversion. But in these individual cases, <clears throat> but there, there must be individual cases, I would say yes. Well, except in a sense, it's not individual cases anymore. We're now speaking of hundreds of thousands of Jews in America who we can project over the next decades are going to intermarry. So in a sense, it involves a change in historic Jewish policy. To me, every, every problem is an individual problem with the face. You see an Remember individual face, face I right? See you face. see one couple. <laughs> I see the face, first of all. 
Was that an invitation that everyone could study with you for the next few weeks? <laughs> <laughs> by, by the way, I, I think I read that um, in your classes at Boston University, before a student can enroll in one of your classes, they, they, they meet with you ahead of time. Most students are with me or with my assistants, but I want, to, I want to know every student, and I see every student alone at least once a semester. I must not confess to you, I'm passionately involved with the life of my students. I love them. That's why I don't take sabbaticals. <laughs> and they, they could do without me, I cannot do without them. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I really am involved because there's something. I always wanted to be a teacher when I was a child, really. I had, if you would ask me when I was 10 or 12, what do you want to do? I would say, I want to be a Rosh Hashiva, which means a teacher, or a Melamed, why not? And a writer, I wanted to write commentaries. You know, I didn't think about novels, who knew what novels meant, I didn't know about it. I wanted to write commentaries on the Bible, on Talmud, and so forth. And here I am, I'm a teacher and a writer, you see. Uh, the, the more you, you've studied our tradition, have you found areas in which you find yourself in conflict with Judaism? And if so, how do you go about resolving that? Oh, naturally, how can you not be always in conflict? Uh, life is conflict, art is conflict, literature is conflict. Without conflict, there is nothing. We are meant to leave conflicts. We do a good job. We do a good job. <laughs> <laughs> but somehow, look, I always come back to that. When I, when I have my troubles, I, look, I, I had problems with, with the Kadosh Baruch Hu. Naturally, I had problems. Who didn't? And the only thing I say to myself, all right, if I have problems with the Rabbi Nishalayim, what's the fault of Rabbi Akiva? Why should he suffer? Or, 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 or mm -hmm. my readers, or my students, or something. Why should they suffer? So, I, again, I come back to the individual person. I say, uh, I owe it to him or to her. <coughs> and then the conflicts, the main conflicts. You know, the, you know the, the very beautiful story, you know, the story is, the Pinchas, the Pinchas the college, uh, tells a story that uh, once a man came to him and said, look, the Pinchas, Rabbi, Rabbi, he said, I have doubts. I cannot study, I have doubts. So uh, the college says to him, all right, start fast twice a week. He fasted, he came back, Rabbi, I fast, it doesn't help, I have doubts, I cannot study. So he told him a story, he said, it happened to me. Once I had doubts. And I couldn't study. I had a page of a Talmud before me. I couldn't continue. But then I heard that the Baal Shem Tov, the master of the good name, came into town. I knew where he, where he uh, stayed. I went there. It was Mincha. So they davened, I davened. And when the Baal Shem Tov finished the Mincha service, the silent Mincha service, he made the three steps backward, and he looked around, and he looked at everybody. I was convinced he looked only at me, but so was everyone else. And then, said the Pinchas, I went back to my room, and I opened the Talmud again. And he said, you see, the doubts remain doubts, the questions remain questions, but I could continue. Mm. So the questions remain questions, but I can continue. I want to ask you something that, in a sense, combines two issues David raised, his opening issue, if you were the moral advisor to the president, and the issue of conflict. A lot of people, myself included, you know, when we watch the news or read about it, think of things we would say to the president. I suspect a lot of people, if they actually met the president, might shy away and not say it. I'm curious, were you, one of the acts that you've done, which received an enormous amount of publicity and was extremely important, was your statement to President Reagan before Bitburg. Were you nervous before you did that? What went through your mind? I'm just curious, because there must have been a combination of emotions. So I'll tell you something. I am afraid of a policeman more than of the president. <laughs> <laughs> I, I really, I'm, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not joking. I'm a refugee at heart. I remain a refugee. When I see a policeman, my God, when I drive rarely and with my wife, and I have to make a U-turn, I stop. <laughs> and she makes the U-turn. <laughs> When I come back from Europe, you know, I never buy anything. I don't have time, I don't know what, I don't dare. I never buy anything, and yet I'm afraid 
I'm afraid the custom officer will look at me and say, ah, but the, the president, what should be your favorite president? <laughs> now, on the other hand, look, I, I knew what was at stake. First of all, but very few people know that before I gave that address, before the ceremony, when I gave him the Congressional Gold Medal, I sent him my speech. That the Heretz, you must have respect for the office because he represents the American people. So I sent him my speech. With a note, Mr. President, this is what I'm going to say. There is still time to change. And then I met him before the ceremony. And I we spoke and I said to him, oh, Mr. President, look, you still have time. You will be the hero. If after you give me the medal and, I, and after my speech, you come back and you simply say, OK, I'm not going. <laughs> See, I gave advice. He didn't listen. <laughs> but I felt mainly, really, I felt, look, I, I, I not afraid. I wasn't, not fear. I felt the responsibility because at that moment, it is the Jew in me who spoke. And therefore, I felt that whatever I said somehow would imply, involve the Jewish people or Jewish honor. And for me, it's very important. Jewish honor is a very important concept. That was my main. But, but you know, they didn't understand it. They didn't know what was happening. Because the president read the speech, or at least I think he did. And then uh, I made my speech. <laughs> I made my speech. And they didn't, it, I don't like Russian horror. You are going to write a book about it. I don't like Russian yeah. horror. But there was a Jewish advisor to the president who was a Jewish advisor to the president. Right. As Way. <laughs> <laughs> He's the one who tried to, to prevent me from really speaking. Yeah. Not the president, he. And uh, when, I, when I finished speaking, before that, we were supposed to have the ceremony in the East Room, which has 300 seats. But then the Bitburg affair began, and they changed the, 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 the place for the smallest room in the White House. 30 people were there, including the Secret Service. Uh -huh. They saw they would get away with it quickly. Little did they know there's going to be live television and so forth. So once we finished, the chief of staff called me. In, and he said, look, on behalf of the president myself, we want to thank you for all what you, the way you spoke with respect, and therefore you made history today. And we have a suggestion. The president would like you to come with him on Air Force One. <laughs> you know, I usually use a shuttle, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Air Force One. And he said, I said, what for? He said, you come with us to Europe. And naively I saw that means that I convinced the president. Uh -huh. I said, and then what? Where are we going? He said, we go to France, and only you speak and he speaks. Then we go to Portugal, only he speaks and you speak. And each time I said, and then. <laughs> I was only afraid of one thing, that I will have to come back to teach my class in Boston. How will I come back? Will they give me Air Force Two? <laughs> A lot of people would have been pleased to see I, you in Air Force Two. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I said, and then. We went on and on, then we go to Bonn, and then we go to, to, to Bergen Belsen. You speak, he speaks. I said, and then? He said, and then we quickly go to Bitburg. <laughs> I said, Mr. Regan, I don't want him to go. <laughs> you want me to go? <laughs> so how can you be a moral advisor to the president? <laughs> you, you mentioned Bitburg. You, you had remained silent about the Holocaust for many years until you wrote Night. And I believe you, you credit Francois Mariac for its publication. Um, you were a journalist invited to interview him. How, how did that lead to the publication of Night? No, it was much more funnier than that. I was working for a, a Israeli paper in Paris then called the Idiot Achronot, which was then the poorest paper in Israel. And when I left it, it became the richest paper in Israel. <laughs> <laughs> so at that time, I was there, and 1954, Mendes France became prime minister of France. And he called the fantasy of the French people. Uh, later on, he paid for it. The anti-Semites uh, fought him and, and torpedoed him. But in the beginning, because he said, I'm going to finish the war in, Viet in, in Indochina in 100 days. So it was a great wager. 
My editor in Israel said, you must get an interview with Mendes France. I was ready, but he wasn't. I wrote letters, nothing doing. Uh, you know, after all, why should they give an interview? Idiot or not. The smallest paper, the poorest paper in Israel. And every morning, I would get a telegram from my paper. Knew what happened with the interview. <laughs> so I wrote a letter to Mendes France, dear Mr. Prime Minister, if you don't give me an interview, one of the two things will happen. Either I'll be fired, or because of the telegrams, the paper will go broke. <laughs> he answered me a nice letter, and he said, I cannot give you an interview. But if either of these two things happen, tell me I'll give you a job. <laughs> then <clears throat> I, sent, I called up my editor. I said, look what happened. Oh, he said, you see, now you have relations with him. <laughs> Get an interview. I couldn't. Then one day I saw uh, François Mauriac at the reception of the Israeli embassy. And everybody knew that the guru, Mendes France's guru, was François Mauriac. He was his teacher, his moral teacher, really. He's the one who brought him to power. I came up to him and said, can I get, I would like to see you. He said, what well, interview? <clears throat> Thinking I'll come to Mauriac to interview Mauriac. At one point I'll say, how about helping me? You know, mm -hmm. you are a Catholic, I'm a Jew, Mendes France is a Jew. Why shouldn't the Catholic help two Jews to get together? <laughs> <laughs> so he said, yes, I'll give him, and he decided when to meet. I came to see Mauriac, and I knew his work. He, is a very, he was a very, very great writer, and a decent person, one of the very few pure writers in France who during the war behaved well. And each question I asked, he would answer with, Jesus, he was in love with Jesus. I mean, it's, it's serious. For him, Christianity meant Jesus. Anything I asked was Jesus. Finally, you know, I, I asked him about Mendes France. What about Mendes France? Oh, he said, like Jesus. Jesus was persecuted. He is persecuted. I, I did something which I have never done in my life. Never. I was disrespectful. I got up and I said, Mr. Moya, or in French you say maître, Mr. Moya, 10 years ago I have known hundreds of Jewish children. <clears throat> and they suffered more than Jesus suffered on the cross. And we don't talk about it. And I left. And I was already at the elevator. And I heard him come after me. And he pulled me back. We came back and the same room. We sat facing each other, and he began to weep. He wept, and we never spoke about that period. Not a word. Then I he took me to the elevator again, and then he said, maybe you are wrong. Maybe you should talk about it. Then my period of silence of 10 years ended. I wrote in Yiddish, in the Welt hat geschwiegen, had translated in French, I sent him the manuscript. And he personally went from one publisher to another to find a publication, and he did. That's how I knew. You took another, you also had taken a vow of silence in India for a year, had you not? That's something else. In India, it's a different story. In India, what, what was the motivation? Was it literally a vow of silence? You, you didn't in India, it was silence, yes. <clears throat> in, in, for the 10 years that I had in Paris, was simply silence about this subject. Right. Not to discuss. Even now, you know, I, I speak so rarely about it because, again, I, I, I want to maintain its purity. Mm -hmm. But at, 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 at that time, that was my main thing. One day I will bear witness, but it must be pure. Mm -hmm. And in India it was different. I came to India, I was, at that time I was taken by the Indian culture very deeply, uh, very deeply. I, I, I knew the Upanishads by heart, the, 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 the uh, Gitas, the Vedas by heart. And there is one practice in India about silence too, what I used. It didn't last long. The, the vow of silence about speaking about the Holocaust obviously ended, and you wrote Night. And today, I know you have played a role in helping, the same way Moriak played such a role in helping to get your manuscript published, I know you have played that role in getting 
manuscript after manuscript on the Holocaust published. One reason I suspect is, a few reasons. One I suspect is you feel every pe person has a right to have their story recorded. Another, I would guess, because I know it's why I think it's so important, is the fear of the growth of revisionism. Do you remember the first time you ever came across somebody who denied that the Holocaust had happened? No. I would not be in the same room with such a person. Literally, I would leave. Because or the first time then that you <coughs> heard about it. It happened, it happened a question. I was once giving a lecture in a university, and then a question period came, and, uh, and one, one question was, <coughs> How can you be sure that it's true or something? It was, it was not a denial, it was in a question form. Even then, I refused to answer. I would never grant them the dignity of a debate, those revisionists. The problem is that they are getting stronger and stronger mm -hmm. and richer and richer. They have much money. I don't know where from. They have much money. I'll give you an example. <clears throat> I was in New Orleans a few months ago giving a lecture. Outside, I was speaking about philosophy. And outside, they were distributing leaflets that the Holocaust never occurred. While I was getting the Nobel Prize. Inside, it's, it's a ceremony, you know, can, uh, with all your blasé, uh, it, it's, it's a very special ceremony. While we were having the ceremony inside, outside, there was a demonstration. And the deniers came from all over Europe again, to demonstrate and to shout and to distribute leaflets that the Holocaust never occurred. They are well organized, and they know what they are doing. So of course I'm worried about it, but I believe that the only way for us to answer is to work harder, which means to do it better, to have more courses, and I mean good courses, and better books, and, and, and students, and teachers, positively, but not fighting them. Is that going to make the difference? I'm wondering. It seems to me that the Holocaust is probably at this point in time the best documented Absolutely. atrocity in the history of the world. <clears throat> mm -hmm. oh, it's frightening about the perversity of anti-Semitism that people would try and, and deny this. Who do you suspect is the money behind it? The logical place, I would imagine, is somehow rooted in the Arab world. Well, because the hear, denial of the Holocaust leads to the delegitimization of Israel. Well, we hear this, this, that Gaddafi is behind it. But I don't know. That's what I heard, is Gaddafi sent the money anyway. Hmm. Now, uh, deep down, I'm confident. I don't think that the memory will be wiped out. I think that we somehow, we Jews, have such a commitment to memory that this event will not be forgotten. And as you know, we all know, this is the most documented, the best documented event, in, not only tragedy, event in history. Because everybody wrote about it. The victims wrote about it. The dead wrote about it. Mm -hmm. The killers wrote about it. The, 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 uh, the, the neutrals wrote about it. Those who stood by wrote, everybody wrote about it. Millions and millions of documents and pictures and photos and films, it's there. So I'm not afraid that that will be forgotten. I am much more afraid of the banalization, of the trivialization, of the cheapening of that memory. I want to shift a little bit to a uh, contemporary issue, although it's not only contemporary. Um, one of the things I love about Judaism is that everywhere that it seems to have touched, it has raised the value of human life to an infinite value. Um, I never feel that I'm in a position to judge the suffering of another human being, but issues have, have come up lately which, which force us to con confront something. We have a tradition which teaches us a tremendous reverence for life, and also a tradition which clearly has a passion to eliminate human suffering. I'm getting to the question of the right to die. Is there a time, assuming a patient has willed it, where we can or should turn off life support systems? I must tell you, David, I have not really studied it well enough. I was asked this question by a cardinal, too, and who wanted me about abortion. <laughs> what is the Jewish uh, position? I have not studied it well enough, and I'm too responsible with my words. I, I cannot answer you on that. I'm still studying. 
I was recently asked this question, and I, uh, perhaps you can guide me here. How do you decide, from a Jewish perspective, where we should put our, our resources? For example, in teaching a class at the UJA Federation, many of the, 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 the people who work there said to me that they're confronted by this question a lot. Should a Jew give all of his or her money to, to a Jewish tzedakah? Should they divide it? What percentage should go? To what extent should they uh, occupy themselves with Jewish concerns? Uh, what percentage with non-Jewish concerns? How do you guide yourself in those issues? Well, halachically, it's clear. Meaning the poor of your, of your town come first. I'll tell you what I said. Forgive me for repeating it. I said it in my Nobel address. I said, please don't give me your price under false pretenses. My priority is a Jewish priority. I am first concerned with Jewish fears, Jewish problems, Jewish tragedy, Jewish, whatever is Jewish. But my priority is not an exclusive priority. I am also concerned with everybody else, if I can. But to tell you that if I have, let's say, first, if Israel is in danger, let's say, or we need to, to work for, for Syrian Jews who are still in, in prison, so to speak, or Yemen Jews, you know, there are still 2,000 Jews in Yemen, and we don't even do anything about it, or not enough, at least. As a Jew, first, I try to help them. But that is not in contradiction with what I say. They, too, are human beings, after all. OK, they are Jews. They are human beings, too. But if we wouldn't help them, who would? So we help them. I try to help. I think we should all help. But then it should not, we should not exclude the others. Many people need us. I'm curious, with the centrality, obviously, of Jewishness in your life and, and your experiences in the war, had somebody been speaking to you in the late 40s and you had been talking about the rise of Israel, would you have assumed at that time in your life that you would end up living in Israel? I wanted to go to Israel uh, in 1945, meaning when <clears throat> we were liberated and the American army, we were 400 youngsters, and the American army asked us, where do you want to go? We didn't want to go home, because there was nothing for nobody to go home to. So we all said Palestine, and the British didn't give us visas, a certificate it was called then. Then I wanted to go there. We came to France, and a few of us got certificates because they had family there. Those some, two of those people you know is Rav Lau, oh. who the new chief rabbi of Israel, and his brother Rav Talilavi, mm -hmm. who was Dayan's advisor. They were together with us. We were together in the same place. The chief rabbi was the youngest. He was six years old then. Hmm. And when he, we came to France together, and then when they learned something that he reminded me, when they learned about the tragedy in Pietrikov, they come from Pietrikov, that they lost their parents, I taught the chief rabbi Kaddish. Hmm. I taught him how to, how to say Kaddish. So at that time, we all wanted to go. We couldn't. Then in 1947, when the, uh, I was a student in Paris then, I lived in a children's home. Um, and we read every day about struggling Palestine. So I wanted to go. And I wanted to join the Haganah. I read about the Haganah, to join the Haganah. So I came to the Jewish agency. I remember the address, 143 Avenue Bagram. And the doorman opened. He said, what do you want? I said, I want to join the Haganah. So he <laughs> <laughs> Then I saw, I found a Jewish paper, a Yiddish paper, called Zion in Kampf. And it was an illegal, it's crazy, it's an illegal paper because it was a clandestine, Irgun, I didn't know it belonged to the Irgun. Yeah. I didn't know that. And I saw the Zion in Kampf, it had the address of the printer. <laughs> oh. So it was clandestine, but it had the address of the printer, that's the law. I wrote a letter to the editor saying, I'm a student, I would like to, to do something, can you help me do something for, for, for the Jewish people in Palestine? The editor called me and he said, why not work for us? So I began writing for that paper in Yiddish. And then I found out it was a Irgun paper. Then Israel became a state that, at that point, I could have gone. I didn't. I must tell you, my, I have my own mysterious problems about why I, I don't live in Israel. 
Uh, I think every Jew should have such questions. Every Jew should ask himself or herself, why don't I live in Israel? I am one of them. I also ask this question. And uh, then I came to Israel already as a French correspondent, a war correspondent, for a few weeks. And since mm -hmm. then, I go back off. The, uh, the story of your American citizenship comes to mind now. I don't know if it's well known. C could you share the story with us of how you became an American citizen? Well, I was in France. I was stateless. I never had a passport in my life. I was stateless in France. And this, in France, I'll tell you why. When we crossed the border from Germany to France, the train stopped, and the police commissioner spoke to us in French. Nobody understood a word. And there was no translator. And all he said is, who wants to become a French citizen should raise his hand. Nobody understood it, but there were some of us <laughs> who always raised their hands. You know? <laughs> so they became French citizens on the spot. <laughs> In my file, they wrote, refused French citizenship. <laughs> As a result, I couldn't become a citizen. And I had to go to the police every year and renew my identity card or something. And believe me, Golos is Golos. If you can't imagine the, 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 the anguish one, can, one goes through. Then I came to America for one year. Hardly had I arrived in America, in New York, uh, working for Yudhotachon. I, I remember $160 a month, including expenses. Uh, you know, I was so terribly poor then. I must confess to you something which, it's Purim, why not tell you a Purim story? It's a true story. I, 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 had, I worked for the United Nations. I didn't have money to buy soap. So I stole the soap from the men's room from the United Nations. <laughs> Look, a society is judged and defined by its attitude towards the weak, the unprotected, the helpless, the sick, the children, the old, and the stranger. A society that does not behave correctly, morally, humanly towards a stranger, that society, you should know, is not moral. There is something wrong with that society. And it's interesting, I have found over the years, I often ask people at lectures when we're talking, I'll say, you know, there are three loves that, that are commanded among the 613 laws in the Torah. People know, love your neighbor, they know, love God. Relatively few Jews are aware that, of course, the third commanded love is the love of the stranger. With one, one, one exception, and I said it here at the Y once at one of my lectures, uh, there are three terms in, in the Torah that define the stranger. One is, one is what? One is ger, mm -hmm. right? Which means a stranger. And ger is a good one, a good stranger, because the, the derivative is like hit gayer, meaning ultimately he becomes a ger tzedek, he becomes a good, a just, a just stranger. Mm -hmm. Then comes nochri, from nechar, somebody who is a strange. With the first one, we are so gentle, we are so generous, we do everything good for that person. We must. We are hafta et hager, as you mm -hmm. said. You must love that stranger. Nochri is a little bit less, but still good. Then comes the third one, which is zar, zayin reish. And there we are very harsh. Mm -hmm. Zar ki yochal, such a stranger who eats, let's say, from Pesach, is Zarki Yikraf is, is, is such a stranger who is coming close to the temple or to the sanctuary. Mot Yumat, that punishment. And I was wondering, why are we so harsh with the Zar? Mm -hmm. Until it dawned upon me. The Ger is a real stranger. The Nochri is a stranger. Zar is a Jew who is a stranger. Which means those Jews who hate themselves, who hate us as Jews, that is the worst stranger that we face. And there, there is no pity in the Torah about it. Hmm. I, actually, I think that 
36 times in the Torah, we are reminded that we, to treat the stranger properly yeah. because we were strangers in the land of Egypt. And, and, I, and I think the rabbis have a discussion about that and, 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 and say why so many times are we reminded of that. And one of the explanations that has always been very, very insightful that, that, I, that, I, that I read was that um, people, when they are in positions of authority who have been repressed for much of their lives, often become an oppressive people as well. And the example that, that uh, actually one of the students of mine gave to me was um, a child who had been abused by their parents. We know that, that while most mm -hmm. children who are abused by their parents do not abuse their own children, there still is a disproportionate amount of mm -hmm. abuse from them. And you would think of all people who had suffered, they would be the most sensitive. But quite the contrary, it seems to be. That, so we're reminded, should we Jews be in a position of authority? You know, in the, after the Ten Commandments in the Torah, the next law is the Eila Mishpatim. These are the laws you should tassim befanehem. Do not own slaves. Not only that, a slave who wants to be sla a slave is to be punished. And now, again, think about it psychologically. As you just said, any psychologist will tell you, a slave, when that slave is free, he wants to become an owner of slaves. Mm. And here, you have a tribe, still a tribe. In Egypt, it was a tribe of slaves. Now they are free, because God made them free. And right away, Moses says, no slaves, wait a second, no slaves. That's very beautiful. Mm. I like that. Because mm. sla what is slavery? Humiliation. And we are against humiliation. That's why a girl or a stranger, we must respect the stranger. Dignity, not humiliation. An odd question just occurred to me. You have been interviewed many times and have written in many journals. And there's one American journal that over the years has interviewed virtually all major figures in American life. They, I don't think you've ever appeared, and I wonder if they've ever asked you Playboy. Have they asked you? And if you said no, I'm curious. Did they ask me? <laughs> I mean, it's inconceivable to me that they wouldn't. They are right. still asking. <laughs> right. Something even in more interesting. There's some other journal which is even worse than that. I didn't know a man came called, 10 years ago, so called me up. And he worked for NBC. And he wants an interview. I said, all right, interview, why not? He came. And then I said, where? Is it for? And he gave me the name. I don't want to mention that other, other magazine. And I didn't react. I said, OK. So he repeated. I said, all right. And then I got suspicious. I said, could you send me an issue of that? <laughs> so he sent me an issue. <laughs> <laughs> I had a problem. I didn't know what to do with it. Uh -huh. If I put it in a wastebasket, what will my neighbors say? <laughs> So I thought of putting it in the street in a wastebasket. I said, if somebody beside might see me. Uh -huh. So what I did, I put it in all kinds of bags. And, <laughs> and then when I went, I took a plane. When I went on the plane, I left it somewhere. There. <laughs> so Playboy asked me many times. And they are, even this month, they're asking me. But I cannot see myself speak about Rabbi Shimon ben Yochai and the bash uh, next to certain very beautiful girls. Uh -huh. <laughs> Let me ask you a... It's not against the magazine. Some people like it, I'm sure, but I, no, I don't I know, read no, it. I, I don't I, read it. I'm no, going to check my airline up top yeah. next time. <laughs> <laughs> Ellie Wiesel was here. That's <laughs> right. No, I, I was curious because I have been amazed over the, num the number of years the prominent Americans in fact, Carter, of course, ended up having tsaris lust, from it. Lust in his but he heart. probably felt he had to do it to show he wasn't so straight laced. Look, many Jewish writers think that. Their, their argument is a good argument. They said, look, we also have serious writers there. Furthermore, they say, you reach, you reach millions of people. It's true. I would reach in that magazine alone more than I have reached in my whole life with my books. <laughs> but I'll tell you, my problem is I am not looking for numbers. Uh -huh. Numbers never matter to me. Let me ask you on a, on a daily issue, because it's occurred to me, I wondered, 
what your attitude is, a perplexing moral problem, which I find I'm totally inconsistent on. I think David finds the same. One thing, tell me, how yeah. come that you know that so many writers for Playboy? <laughs> <laughs> I could give you an I could give you a Your dishonest answer. Right. I give you a dishonest answer that has accuracy in it. This you is know that Playboy, Playboy periodically publishes them as separate books without any pictures. I have those books. <laughs> You know, G Jimmy Carter would... President Wait, I want to know something. <laughs> I want to know. I want to find out how fully honest you are. Prior right. to that man sending you that publication, you truly had not heard of it or didn't know what it was? I knew what it was. I didn't... That, that other magazine, though. That other magazine, which sounds suspiciously like the top floor of a house. I, 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 I must... I could... Really? I had no idea what it was. Let me ask you on a, uh, okay, uh, a daily a perplexing problem. I find I'm utterly inconsistent on the issue of giving to beggars in the street. Anytime I, read, anytime I study something in, in Rambam or in the Gemara, the next day I find I give to a higher percentage. I find I'm inconsistent. I give to some, I don't give to others. There's no particular logic. I'm more apt, I find, to give to women beggars. Do you have a response? I mean... I, I have the same problem, but I give also because I, I, I know that what they, they, they say, we haven't eaten. But usually it's one person saying, I haven't eaten to that. Oh. How can I not? I, eaten. I know very well that that person will go and buy alcohol or something else. Mm -hmm. But I cannot, not, I, so, I cannot, I cannot not put my hand in my pocket and give, not much, but at least to the church. You know, the, the Talmud, Yadola Yona, Yadola Tachtona. Better to have Yadola Yona like that than, than mm -hmm. like that. So. I also am curious, going back, by the way, President Carter was here a few months ago and he, he related a very funny story um, that, about that, that, that Playboy interview about reflecting the fact that he lusted in his heart for other women. Apparently, uh, he, was, he was doing a book signing here in New York um, about two months ago and there was a woman who walked up to him and as, as he was, and I hope I'm, I'm relaying the story right because I heard it secondhand, but apparently as he was signing her book, she said, Excuse me, President Carter, if you're lusting, I'm still around. So, <laughs> I want to go to a, to a more serious question. I, I, do you believe in, in a sense of, of ultimate justice? And does that in any way impact on your view or your sense of, of an afterlife? Ultimate justice, no. Because that is called utopia. As you know, Utopia was written by Thomas More. <coughs> he was a contemporary of Erasmus. Mm -hmm. And Utopia means nowhere. There is no such place where only justice exists. No, but afterlife is a different story. Afterlife is something so personal that one day I do, one day I don't. But I must, because if I say anima mean every day, I repeat the Rambam, the Rambam, 13 principles of faith, and you say, he believes in Triyat team, it means he believes in afterlife. But to tell you that I know why or something, I, I, I don't know. Then it's in some way, though, attached to an element of faith. It's faith, but justice is something else. No, I believe that a, a society, a just society, is a society that wants to be just. <coughs> that not that it is, it cannot be. A society is one that has moral aspirations and it is aspiring to be just. And the same is true of a young person. Look, remember the, 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 the seer of Lublin used to say, I prefer a wicked person who says and knows that he is wicked to a just person who knows that he is just. A tzaddik who knows that he is a tzaddik. Because there is something about, about not only about honesty, about sincerity, but also about aspiration. I want to be better. I want to improve. I know I am not perfect. I know that not everything I do, but probably most more things, most things that I do are not correct. That is a, a, the precept which is mine. But I think, it strikes me, I think there might be another reason as well. A mutual friend uh, of ours, uh, Wolf Kelman, Shalom, used to say to me, in my life I've gotten in much more trouble through my Yetzirah Tov, my good instinct, than my Yetzirah my bad instinct, because I can guard against that. 
But very often, when we do things out of good, a lot of the great evils that have been done in history have been done by people uh, out of good. Very few people have ever said they've acted in, in, the, in the name mm -hmm. of evil. You, I think you once said that a Jew may love God, a Jew may fight with God, but a Jew may not ignore God. Is, is that? I mean, I can, uh, a Jew can be Jewish with God, against God, but not without God. It's true. Now, many Jews who are atheists, of course, will oppose me, but that, that means they are against God. Uh, but I believe so. We Do cannot we... somehow, God is so part of our Jewish history and so much part of Jewish sensitivity that uh, you cannot ignore it. If, even if you think you do, you don't. Then how do we instill a sense of godliness in our Jewish children and in the next generation of Jews? By trying to be more human, by trying to be better, by learning. I come back to the same learning, always learn. If, if you ask me really what a Jewish family should do first, I would say absolutely learning. First of all, learning. And where would you tell most people to begin with? with where would you tell people to begin with, <coughs> with the Torah? It's, it's, and anywhere. To, of course, I, I would begin with, with, with Torah for children and then, mm -hmm. and then go to the commentaries. But you know, we, 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 can, we can study one verse of the Torah and, and for, for, for a week or for, for, for five weeks, just one verse. Take the first verse. There's enough there for five weeks. Mm -hmm. Have you felt incursions? of God in your own life. I'm thinking of something that came up as we were speaking uh, before we came out here, and you were mentioning to David and I a very unusual incident that had happened to you in India where a fortune teller uh, had stopped you and wanted to prophesy your future. If you could tell it, I mean, it was... Uh... <clears throat> I'm here for that, I'll tell you. <laughs> anyway, I'll tell you this. Your repartee, was, your repartee there was so quick, I was impressed. A fortune teller stopped Ellie in the street and said, for five rupees, I'll tell you your future. He said, I'll give you 10 rupees if you can tell me my past. <laughs> so, nevertheless, about gospel, I, I, some of you may, may know what I'm trying to do. I rarely speak about God. As, as like, like Kafka, I try to speak to, but not, not about. And, uh, but there is something I, I do believe, at least I do believe, that the Jew in me has faith and will maintain his faith in spite of everything else. Not because of everything else, but in spite of everything else. Mm -hmm. Does that have anything to do with the concept of being chosen? You mean the Jewish people chosen? Yes. I think the Jewish people we say it in our prayers, you have chosen us. But I do believe that here we are trying to show something to other people as well, that every human being is chosen. Every human being is unique. You know, the enemy, the enemy uh, tried to reassure itself, himself, that in, uh, in doing away with us, <clears throat> the Jewish doctors, Jewish writers. It's nothing because nobody, they used to say, is irreplaceable. And that I oppose that. No human being is replaceable. You remember that Talmud says, a beautiful image, which actually, in, if I paraphrase it, since the beginning of time to the end of time, there will never be another you. You may have children. People who resemble you, people who have certain traits of character which are yours, but never will there be another you. This is the way you think about it. Maybe this is the Selim of Kim. This is the, the image of God. The uniqueness of the human being, that we are all unique, all of us. Adam was not Jewish. Adam was a human being. And Adam was created in that image, meaning that we must see the center of the universe in every human being. And you know what else that, that, that makes me think? <coughs> that not only when you think of the individuals who've been killed, but the other Talmudic insight on that, where God calls out uh, to Cain, called the Meachicha, and uses the plural, the bloods of your brother. Why the bloods? Sure. The bloods of all his descendants. Yeah. 
Within 50 years from now, every one of the Jews who perished in the Shoah would no longer be alive. But the crime continues for eternity. Because I think, who would have come out of those people? Yeah. One final question, and I think, for the evening. And then we go to Pesach, the four questions of Pesach. <laughs> <laughs> I have a feeling that we would all be very pleased to stay here until Pesach with you tonight. Um, have you ever thought of running for political office? Sure, for president. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> and then you'll be my moral advisor. <laughs> Never. I don't want. I never wanted any position. Never. I don't. I wouldn't get it. I really. They should be crazy to appoint me to anything. Uh, really. What? What do I know about these things? And politi I am so afraid of power. Really. Not only of other people's power, of my own. If I had one, uh -huh. I wouldn't know what to do with it. So I. I never thought. Well, well, then I have one more final question. <laughs> <laughs> the, the truth is, Jews do have power in Israel. Um, how do you feel about, and how, sh how do you feel about American Jews being critical of Israeli policy? Um, and if you feel they shouldn't be public in their criticism, for those who might ask how they should criticize, what do you suggest? Well, I can tell you about myself, you know, but, uh, what others do. I, I have no right to criticize them either. I do not tell Israel what to do. I cannot. I don't live there. And I, 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 I go there of, well, for, for maybe the wrong reasons. When Israel, let's say, the scout missiles, I went there. I was there, I had the scouts falling. Okay, big deal, there it is. I didn't know how to put on my gas mask. I, I, I'm, I'm so uh, cumbersome, I don't know what to do. Therefore, I made my decision for myself that I, all I owe the Jewish people, I owe Israel, is Ahavat Israel, I love Israel. People of Israel, and I love the state of Israel. But because I do not live in Israel, I put certain obligations which I must adhere to, meaning even when Israel does things that I don't agree with, then I find, I find ways how to tell Israeli leaders that I don't agree and so forth. But I would not write about it in the New York Times. Thank you. Thanks for listening. For more information on 92nd Street Y and all of our programs, please visit us on the web at 92y.org. This program is copyright by 92nd Street Y.